What's up, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Blood on the Razor Wire TV, where we bring it to you real and we bring it to you raw. Hit that subscribe button, hit the like button, make sure you share the video. Today, I got a special guest on. I don't want to do too much talking about him. I'd rather he introduce himself. Tell the people who you are, where you're from, and a little bit about your situation. Well, uh, my name is uh, Gilbert Galvin, and I am um, currently residing in a... Uh, a treatment facility uh, for alcoholism. Um, best move of my life. Uh, finally, I remember what it's like to be sober again. And it's nice. Um, um, did a considerable amount of uh, prison time, 17 years. Um, split between uh, Canada and the U.S. Um, I'm currently not on any uh pro or or anything like that uh but i am the subject of a movie that's just about to be released in a couple months uh called bandit and uh it's uh stars uh mel gibson uh josh Jermel, uh and uh lisa i don't know if i'm pronouncing her last name right lisa cutthroat um uh, which uh, I got to go down and, and meet uh, Mel and, and Josh. Uh, they, they were uh, they were pretty cool, but but Mel Gibson was really cool. He was just he was a different kind of guy. He's been through, he's been through some things in his life too, right? Oh yeah, he uh, <clears throat> you know he uh, you know that movie he made, uh, The Passion of Christ, uh, that that crossed over a billion dollars. Uh, I mean, it, it, and they, they're making a sequel to it. I, I don't know how that would work, but, um, they're doing a sequel to it. I mean, for Christ, you can only die once on a cross, but you know, I mean, uh, I mean, I'm not making fun of them. I'm just saying, I don't, I don't, I don't really understand it, but I'm sure they know what they're doing. Um, so the movie about me is, um, uh, uh, about my uh, exploits in Canada, I escaped. Uh, actually, uh, is, I'll try to be as brief as I can. I uh, I escaped out of a jail in uh, uh, Michigan, uh, um, Centerville, Michigan, and uh, had a friend pick me up and uh, drove me across the border to Canada, where I pres presided for uh, <laughs> lived for the last. Uh, um, I, I, I lived there for about five years before I got arrested up there, but I, um, I went on a tour, uh, committed, uh, 63, uh, bank robberies and, uh, and jewelry stores combined. Um, obviously stole millions and, um, all, and I was living, uh, with my wife and uh, daughter and we were um, we just lived a quiet little life, you know, like we weren't, uh, uh, she didn't really know what was going on. Um, I want to ask you, I want to ask you a little bit about it, right? I want to get into a couple things. The okay. flying bandit, you were dubbed the flying bandit, right? Yeah. And the reason for that is what they said you'd fly in on a plane and I'd fly uh, to all the, uh, I mean, I flew all over Canada to the different locations uh, back then, this is obviously pre nine eleven. Um, you could load up, uh, you know, uh, my arms would go in, in the suitcase to the check in, and you know, they'd be in the belly of the plane uh, on the way to my location. Um, you can't do that today, you know. You mean uh, just doesn't work like that. I mean, home homeland security and. And it's a whole different world out there now. Uh, you could never do it today. What made you uh, want to start robbing banks? Well, uh, when I escaped and I went up there, um, believe it or not, um, the first job I got was uh, selling ice cream in one of those on one of those bikes. And the reason I took that was one, they didn't ask for no ID any ID and two, it was cash in my pocket every day. 
And then uh, from there, I went to construction. And uh, I, uh, while all this was going on, I, I, I was dating uh, uh, a social worker from one of the, uh, uh, what do they call them, hostels up in uh, Canada, in Ottawa. And uh, um, after I was working construction for uh, for a little bit, I'd saved up enough money, and I I mean my whole I the, I, I always intended to leave Ottawa. I mean I I, I was going to go to Vancouver, and um, and and then you know just start a, a, a new life there because I finally had some ID and uh, and I had a couple bucks so I could get going. And one thing I used to do is I, I mean, I used to just, I used to read the newspapers, all of them I could get a hold of, uh, to, to, uh, uh, to be familiar with Canadian politics, Canadian, uh, you know, what was going on in Canada, what was going on in, uh, where I was living so that if I was questioned, I mean, you know, I, I, I already started acquiring a, a, a Canadian accent um, after a few months. I mean, it's just automatic. You just, just you, you know, it, it wasn't something I tried to do. It's just something that happened. So did you just decide, hey, I'm going to go to Canada and I'm going to start robbing banks? Is that is that what you no, said? Oh, no, 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 not at all. I didn't, I, 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 I didn't have any plans about anything. I mean, I was, everything was just kind of up in the air. But when I was reading these papers, I noticed that there was like every day there's a bank robbery. And I'm like, how is that possible? If this was the States, I mean, man, the FBI would have shut that down like nothing. So I just took a trip uh, in downtown and, and, you know, peeked in or walked into a few banks. And the first thing I noticed was they don't even, they didn't even have security cameras. I was like, in a bank they don't have a security camera and uh then it was that was my um that was my uh at that point i had decided to uh, start robbing banks uh the way i had done it and 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 all that i mean that that came later but i mean i i did get on the bus and i went to vancouver and what it did was it allowed me to see all these cities all the way back out to Vancouver. And I would spend a little bit of time looking around and, uh, um, you know, just starting to put together a plan on, uh, you know, making bank robbery a living. And um, uh, when I got to Vancouver, I, I'm on a really steep learning curve here now. The very first bank I robbed in in uh, Vancouver, I got six hundred dollars. Four days later, I robbed another bank in Calgary, Alberta, and got four thousand dollars. And then two weeks after that, I robbed a bank in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and and, and got close to twelve thousand dollars. And then that was it. You know, the party was on after that. Did you get an adrenaline rush when you walked in the bank and you were getting ready to rob it? No, no, uh, that wasn't where I would get the rush was when I would get back to my hotel room and, uh, and start adding up the, um, you know, the tally, you know, like, um, that's where my throw was. It, it, It wasn't, you know, um, one of the things about the story is that I had never fired a shot. I had never laid my hand on anybody. Uh, even though armed robbery is a violent offense, what I'm saying is there was no violence in the uh, offense. Your conduct, and, wasn't, uh, your conduct right. wasn't violent. Did you go in with guns? Oh, yeah. Uh, so uh, once uh, one of the little... Uh, uh, side stories. I mean, it's it's really cute. I mean, uh, I mean, it's funny. The, I just told you that I went to Halifax and I robbed a bank there. Well, I decided instead of flying back to Ottawa, 
I was going to treat myself to a train ride and, uh, you know, get a bedroom and, and, you know, the whole nine works and be right by the club car. And I, you know, I proceeded to get hammered. And then, uh, while I'm looking out on the, uh, on the uh, scenery, the, uh, the uh, conductor says, uh, this is the last call till we go through uh, U.S. Customs. And I, I, I said, I, I, I know I didn't hear that right. I'm I, U.S. Customs. And I asked him, I said, why would we be going through U.S. Customs? They said, well, we cut through a part of Maine and it cuts about 200 miles off the trip. You know, we save money. And, and I said, oh, I'm on a sealed train. I've got $10,000, $12,000 and guns and I'm like about as screwed as you could get. And um, what happens is immigration or uh, border. I forgot who it is that, that does the U S border at the time. Uh, but um, they get on each end of the, of the train and then they, you know, they walk and meet up and that way they get all the, you know, everybody in between. So uh, I, what I did was I took my, uh, my ID and my uh, train ticket and I just laid it by the door and I acted like I was passed out on the bed. And it just so happened that the conductor uh, was the one that was serving me in the bar. And I heard him say to the, the uh, immigration guy that, uh, oh, he's, he's hammered. He, he's, been drink he's been drinking the whole trip, man. So they picked up the ticket, they looked at the ID, they put it down and they closed the door and they walked on. I mean, I, I mean, I should have been busted right then and there. My, it, my third robbery, you know, I should have been busted, done some Canadian time and then headed back to the U S for prison time, more prison time, but it didn't work out that way. So, um, I kept robbing banks and robbing banks. And then, um, you know, I'm built, I mean, I'm starting to have stuff now, you know, like, I mean, uh, we got a little bit of property. We got a little bungalow. Uh, we're flying to the Bahamas four or five times a year. And, uh, so at this time you're raking in some money, some real money. Oh yeah. And then I, I, I meet up with, with a fence in, in Ottawa, uh, not a fence, the fence. As a matter of fact, uh, Mel Gibson is playing him in the movie. And, um, it was really weird how, we, how I met him. What, uh, I used to go to my little night neighborhood bar and, uh, my bartender is telling me about how he owes, uh, this guy like, uh, $1,600 and he's, he's coming to break his face. I said, well, I said, well, why, why did you borrow money that you couldn't pay back? He said, I didn't borrow money. He says, I bought jewelry. And, and you know, it just didn't work out. He, he couldn't steal enough out of the till. Because, I mean, he, he, he wasn't the owner. He was, he was just working there. So I said, um, I mean, I knew who he was talking about. Okay. I mean, I wasn't completely in the dark. I knew who he was talking about. So I said, when he comes to the bar today, just stay behind the bar and let me talk to him. So he comes in and uh, you got to understand this is a real imposing figure. This is like a guy at the time was weighing about 300 pounds, had over $100,000 worth of jewelry on, on his hands. And one of them was a huge 76 uh, gram gold ring uh in the shape of a devil's head and when he would hit you with that i mean he you know he would he would leave he would leave damage behind now he didn't i don't want to give the impression he'd just go around beating people it wasn't like that at all i mean he'd give this guy he gave this guy time and time and time and to pay it and he didn't so i said uh i went up to him i said mr craig uh my name's uh robert whiteman i was wondering if i could have a couple words with you and he goes, sure, sit down. He goes, what do you want? I said, uh, Chris there owes you 1600 bucks. I said, I'm leaving town. I'll be back in two days. 
uh, and I'll come right to the bar and give you the sixteen hundred dollars. I said, I you know I'm, I got to get a paycheck in and so. And uh, he goes, why would he do that for that piece of shit? I mean, that's literally what he said. I said, ah, because he's my favorite bartender. So uh, two days later, I'm at the I'm back in Halifax, um, and uh, I'm at the airport more fog in. So I got a call, uh, the strip club where he, he had a, he used to manage like seven strip clubs in Ottawa and Hall, Quebec. And I call him up. I said, listen, man, we're fogged in. I said, don't, don't take my word for it. Just call the airport. You know, I'm at the airport right now and you'll see that I'm telling you the truth. Well, he calls and he says, all right, don't worry. Just come tomorrow. Well, about a half hour later, the fog clears. And I'm on a plane back to Ottawa. And I get there before closing. So um, I go right down there and I said, hey, man, I said, I'm, we managed to make it through fog lifted and stuff. I said, what, uh, is there some way? I, I, I said, I want to give you this money. He goes, let's go in the back. And I take out 16 bundles uh, from uh, ones, twos they use up there. Ones, twos, fives, tens, and twenties. And I take them and I put them on his desk. I said, there's $1,600. And he looks at the pile at the desk and he looks at me and he says, you ain't no government servant. You know, he's, I, I gave the impression that I was working, that I worked for the government, you know, like, cause it's a government town, you know, everybody's got some kind of government job. And uh, he goes, you're not, you, you don't work for the government, man. He goes, you, you're robbing jugs, which was his terminology for robbing banks and um i wanted him to know that but i didn't want to say it at first because i needed a connection for guns and and for other stuff and um worked out perfect i mean we got to be, be like, like great, great friends. friends and uh i you know i had an end to what i needed to get you know when i needed to get it uh, so, um, so, um, went on for five years and then, um, you know, I mean, um, how I got caught was we had done a $1.2 million jewelry heist in Vancouver and my partner left a shotgun behind. He got scared and he just left the shotgun behind. Well, you know, shotguns have serial numbers. They traced the serial numbers back to Ottawa. And then uh, and then they started to put it together from there. Because um, we, we were hitting nothing but high-end uh, high jewelry, jewelry stores. stores. And, and one, one of them was, was a chain. chain and that we hit from Toronto all the way out to Vancouver. What was it so, like uh, to have a million dollars, to catch a robbery for a million dollars, man? Well, I'll, I'll tell, tell you what. what. Um, we do the robbery. And, um, and I, the way that I come out, I have to walk right back in front of the store where, you know, there's tops all over the place now. And, and, um, they said, you know, get the hell off the street. There's been a robbery. I said, Oh my God. You know, and I walk across the street and I go to a hotel and I catch a, a cab to my hotel. And, um, uh and i i'm down in the lobby bar and i'm waiting for my my partner to show up and then uh, we go up to the room and i open the briefcase and i'm like sitting at uh they had like two big back chairs and then like a lamp between it and i turned the lamp on and and the light hit these diamonds so perfect that the whole ceiling was like sparkles I mean, uh, you know, these tiny little rainbows, I mean, the whole ceiling. And um, so we started doing the tally. And uh, we get to a quarter million. And then we get to a half million. And then my partner says, I can go out and buy a brand new Corvette right now. <laughs> and I said, yeah, the side of the town you live in, I don't think uh, maybe you want to do that. So then we get to 750. 
And then I see beads of sweat start to go out on, uh, on my partner's forehead. He goes, they ain't never going to let us out of town. I said, stop it, man. Then we get to a million. And then we get to 1.2 million. And he's like, I mean, I've never seen him so scared in my life. I mean, we're, I mean the robbery's over. And uh, we turn on the news and uh, uh, it wasn't on. Uh, I mean, it was too early for it to be on the news at that point because it, it was only a you know couple hours old. So I uh, took my stuff, I put it in an envelope, and uh, and I'm headed out the door. He goes, where are you going? I said, I'm going down to Trader Vic's. I'm getting drunk. I'm putting this in the safety deposit box. He goes, uh, would you put mine in there too? I said, sure, sure, why not? So I put his stuff away, and and, uh, and I go to the bar, and I proceed to get, you know, drunk. The next day, we, oh, he, he finally saw it on the news. And then... Uh, and then I went down to breakfast the next day and I come back with the paper and the headline on it is daring daylight robbery. Um, and they were talking about, they had arrested people. I was like, well, they didn't arrest me. Uh, I mean, I, I did find out that they, you know, they had let those people go cause they, you know, they hadn't done the robbery. And, um, like I said, it, it was at that point where things started to come apart because he, he left the shotgun behind, you know, it gave, gave, it, it, gave it, it a link, link to Ottawa. Ottawa. And, and there, there was, was only, only one person in Ottawa that, that could handle that kind of hot, hot je jewelry, you know? That's what I want to ask you, like I said. What was it like to have the, for you though? I mean, your partner was nervous for you. How did you feel in that moment where you're like, "Damn, man, we got a million dollars worth of shit right here." Oh, oh man, man. I, I, I sat, sat back, back and I was like, my whole life I'd been a half-ass criminal. Okay, I mean, there was no rhyme or reason to my. I mean, I, you know, I run a forge check here or do something goofy there, and now I'm sitting here looking at $1.2 million in diamonds and gems. And I was like, yeah, I've arrived. I'm, I'm there. there. You know, I asked you that because I want to ask you this, right? You got all that money. You were living a pretty lavish life, right? You can go out and do what you want. You lived in different countries, right? Yeah. I know you had spoke about you had a wife and a daughter, right? Yeah. Yeah. And where I'm going with this is this. You ended up doing, what, 17 years of your life in prison, right? Right. Do you think it was worth it? Oh, oh no, no, not, not at all. all. Not, not, not even close. close. At the time, it was worth it. But, but uh, I mean, at no point did I feel sorry for myself. I mean, they, they were offering, uh, if you look at the, uh, the interview that uh, the Fifth Estate did, which is, Canada's version of 60 minutes they'll tell you right on that interview that you know they were they were throwing deals around and uh they offered me um originally 10 years and uh, you know I had to point to everybody and you know testify and they said when when you were done testifying you could go home I mean they, they'd send me back to the states I said you know what I and this really what happened. I said, you know, I, I really don't like that deal. I said, so I'm going to pass. Two days later, they come back and they said, well, we'll give you seven years. We'll put you up in a cabin on a lake. You can be with your wife. And, and she was pregnant with our second child, too. Um, we'll, we'll put you and And all we got to do is just bring you to court and bring you back. You don't even... You won't even see the inside of a cell. And I said, no. Um, it, it wasn't so much that I was um, a hard ass. I mean, it wasn't so much that I was the Superman of, you know, convicts. It wasn't like that at all. I had a wife that was pregnant. And, 
and a two, you know, a, a one-year-old child. And it just wasn't worth putting in at, at risk. I mean, uh, I mean, I don't know if anybody would have done anything, but it wouldn't have mattered. I wasn't going to give them the option to think about it. And uh, they just couldn't believe that. Uh, as a matter of fact, the fence is, uh, it talks about it on this interview. He says, what do you say to a guy that, you know, all he has to do is sign a piece of paper and, and he, you know, basically free and he don't do it. I mean, what do you say to, what, how do you, what do you say to that guy? And, um, how much time did the fence end up with? Did he go to prison as well? No, he didn't get caught for nothing. No, no, because I didn't do that. No, I know that, but he was, he was but he they was never on. caught him with any, they never caught him with any jewelry. All right, but you said he was in the interview. That's why I asked that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, he was in the interview, but um, at no time does he say, you know, oh, yeah, uh, me and Gilbert were partners. He, he never says that, but he does enough implying that, one, it really pissed off the cops. And uh, two, that you, you can pretty much get the, the gist of what, what he's saying and what he's saying it about without coming out and putting himself at risk uh, I'm gonna, criminally. Yeah, I'm going to check that out. Look, so you end up in prison in Canada, right? How yeah. much time did you do in prison in Canada? About seven years. What was it? And that? then... Uh, Sorry. I want to talk about the Canadian prison before we go to the U.S. What was that Canadian prison like? Everyone says it's good over there. Was it violent? I mean. Well, uh, the first four years I spent in, in Max. Now, l let me give you an idea uh, of how this works. I, at the time, I was in the province of Ontario, which at the time had approximately 9 million people. And there's only 350 max cells in the whole province of Ontario. So if you're going to one of those max cells, it's because they really, really don't like you. I mean, you really pissed a lot of people off because almost everybody starts off in medium. Minus, of course, something really heinous or, you know, but other than that, they, they pretty much start out in, in medium. Um, so I was there about four years and then they finally transferred me to, uh, to uh, uh, a medium, which was called Collins Bay. And uh, you're going to love this one. At Christmas time, the cell blocks literally echoed because everybody was home on a Christmas pass. <laughs> Not kidding you. I mean, obviously I wasn't eligible because I was deportable. But um, when I, uh, I got to go to the pro board early because I was deportable. And uh, I said, well, I'm, I'm going to give it a shot. So I put my papers in and, and uh, I go to the pro board and, Man, the guy just goes up one side and down the other on me. He goes, I mean, he's, he's, I mean, God, I thought he was going to kill me. He goes, if it was up to me, he says, I'd give you more time for having the audacity to come up here and ask for a parole. He says, have you learned anything? I said, yeah, I should have stopped at 62. Wrong answer. So, I mean, that was just some of the. Uh, so they don't grant you parole or they do grant you parole? Anecdotal. Oh, no, absolutely not. Okay. But then what happened was a couple years later, a police officer gets killed in a drug raid in Toronto. And the person who killed him was a Jamaican who had had a deportation order on him for years. So, I mean, he shouldn't even have been in the country. So the external affairs minister, which is the equivalent of the secretary of state here, uh, gets on national TV and says, from now on, anybody with a deportation order on them 
is going to be deported and if they want to appeal it they have to do it from their country and i'm watching this on television in my cell so i get out my typewriter and i type them out a little letter and said well i just thought you'd like to know uh, that i'm deportable and when you deport me you're deporting me to prison in a another country and then at the bottom of it i put you know cc the ottawa star um no, I'm sorry, the Toronto Star, the Ottawa Citizen, the, the Canadian Broadcasting Company. So, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm holding him to his word. I mean, I'm not blackmailing him. I mean, that's what he said. About two weeks after I mailed that letter, I get called into my counselor's office. And he says, uh, you've been writing letters to the press again? I don't know what you're talking about. He goes, you got a parole, you got a parole hearing coming up. In uh, 60 days, he goes, I want a parole plan. I said, well, here's my parole plan. You guys are going to parole me. You're going to drive me to the border. Two U.S. Marshals are going to pick me up, and I'm going to go to jail. I mean, that's my parole plan. I said, good enough. No, I, I went to the parole board, and I, I already knew that I, was, I made it. Because how you knew was by who they sent. If they sent these old people that you know been in the system forever that i mean it was it wasn't happening you, you you weren't getting nothing nobody's getting nothing that day but if they sent the young guys and girls out you had a shot if you know if you could present yourself in some kind of uh you know redeemable light so i go in front of them and uh, and i i say to myself i'm i'm gonna make it i'm leaving and uh, they asked us to step out. And about a half hour later, they said, come back in. And um, the lady on the board says, uh, Mr. Galvin, uh, we're not going to leave you in suspense. Uh, you, you have made parole. Uh, we are deporting you back to the United States of America. And we can only impose one condition. I said, what's that? They said that you never ever return to the country of Canada again. I said, well, what if I marry another Canadian? They said, if you marry the prime minister's daughter, you can't come back to Canada. I said, okay, well, I think that's fair enough. I can live with that. And um, two weeks later, they drove me to the border. Two U.S. Marshals picked me up. And then I, I had, uh, I was actually on mandatory release from federal prison in the States. And um, my parole officer meets me in the prison for my mandatory re uh, revocation hearing. And uh, she, she comes up and she sits down next to me and she said, the last time I saw you or the last time I talked to you, you told me you were going to be in my office in an hour. That was 15 years ago. I said, yeah, well, I, mean, I kind of got a little tied up. Um, you know, things didn't work out quite the way I thought they were going to. And I went in and um, I go to sit down and the, the lady at, at the revocation area said, Bat, don't bother. Don't, you don't have to sit down. Uh, mandatory release. Goodbye. So what happens is the old system in the States, well, you probably know about it. Uh, I'm sure you do. When they still had parole, they, now they call them old law prisoners. Uh, I was an old law at that time. And so they release you on your mandatory release. And if you screw up, then they give you another mandatory release date until eventually, you know, you, your sentence is served out. And, um, um, uh, this time when I got out, I, 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 I managed, uh, I started a little business. This is back in the, uh, the late nineties. Uh, I started a little painting business. Um, I get off paper, uh, everything was going great. And then, um, and then my, uh, my drug addictions and my alcoholism caught up to me again. And, um, uh, I went out and started robbing rob banks again. 
Let me ask and, you this. Uh, did your wife wait for you? I mean, did you guys reconnect when you got out oh, of Oh, no. Oh, no, no, no. She she divorced me uh, uh, went up in Canada about, uh, I think it was about three or four years into it. Um, and I, I didn't really expect her. To, I mean, I didn't really even want her to hang out for all that time. You know, so, like, it really just makes it harder on you, too. So. Oh, I understand. No, no, she did the right thing. So let me ask you this. So you get out, you get out of the Canadian prison, you come back to the States, you're free to go, you're free, you're a free man, you end up getting jammed up again, you go back to federal prison, you do time in federal prison. Again. Again. Let me ask yeah. you this, right? Canadian prisons versus United States prisons. Totally different, similar? You tell me. Totally different. No, what, what no ways? similarities whatsoever. Is there violence in that Canadian prison when you were over there? Only, only, you really only see violence in the max. When you're out of the max and the mediums, they're just, they're, they're laid back. They're, there's nobody trying to go back to a max. You know, it, it, it's, it's brutal territory. Um, but I, don't get me wrong. You can, you can go to a max and not say one word to anybody. Okay, and uh, if you don't buy things that you can't afford, uh, you know, drugs, um, as long as you pay it when you say you're going to pay it, it's not a problem. But, you know, you always got some Yahoo, who, you know, just thinks he's going to get an extra week and uh, just didn't work out like that. I, mean, I want to ask uh, you a little bit about Mel Gibson, man. You said he was a pretty cool dude talking to him. Yeah. Did you oh, hang yeah. out you hang out with him a little bit? Yeah. Uh, got some pictures. Um, I did a cameo on uh, one of the scenes that he was working on. Uh, so I am actually got a cameo on the uh, on the picture. That's not much. Believe it or not, I'm sitting at a bar. I mean, what are the odds? Josh, he's playing your part, right? Yeah. How was he in person? Oh, he was uh he, he was he was a nice guy, but but he was like really busy cuz they were running them between two different sets. Uh they 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 had a one set in Tifkin, Georgia, and I don't remember the name of the town, but it was uh they were shooting in that uh town too. So they were running him back and forth. So he was like really, you know, Mel, he just, he just, I mean, he just laid back and had a good time. Um, no stress. Um, an easy part for him. You know, he's made for the part. Um, Did Josh talk to you at all though? Like, hey, what's up, man? How are you? You know, oh, yeah. shoot the shit with you. Yeah, he, he said, um, you know, I mean, uh, we we shot the ship, but not not for very long, for about maybe maybe fifteen minutes. And uh, uh, Mel, I got to talk to a lot, uh, uh, more than one time. Um, and uh, I really liked the guy. I mean, uh, I mean, I yeah, I heard of all about the stuff, you know, in, in California, or you know, the anti-Semitic remarks and all that kind of stuff, but. Uh, I mean, you do all sorts of stupid things when you're drunk, right? I mean, but, uh, I'm sure he could relate to your story a little bit because he's been down that path, you know, and, uh, you know, he was drinking a lot there for a while and all that type yeah. of stuff. So maybe you guys connected because of that, you know? Well, I mean, I, I was drinking when I was there. I mean, uh, I, I mean, I, I, I haven't, you know, I've, I've been sober for a little bit now, um, but I was definitely not sober when I was there. I mean, I was, uh, I was just having the time of my life and, uh, uh, time would have went a lot easier for me if they could have just hooked up a funnel, you know, and just poured the booze down as opposed to, uh, have to stop and drink it every time. Uh, I mean, it was that bad. Let me ask you uh, this. I, I was, I was a terrible alcoholic. I'm sure a lot of people are going to want to know this that are tuning into the show, right? So they're doing this movie about your life, your story. Do they pay you for it? Well, um, 
uh, actually, uh, they already own the rights to the movie. Um, uh, they, they paid me a, a little bit for, uh, uh, they call it a consulting role. Uh, but, um, they already own what happened was, uh, Robert Knuckle is the one who wrote the book, uh, taking down the flying bandit and, uh, he sold the rights to, to the producer who made the movie. And, um, I read that part. They didn't, they didn't owe me anything. Nothing, but they did look out a little bit though. Yeah. Plus, I got to, you know, I mean, uh, you know, go down there for a trip. Uh, no, I, I mean, I don't, I mean, I, 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 I understand the legal aspects of it. I don't feel ripped off, you know, uh, not at all. Not, not even close to that. I mean, um, I'm, you know what? If they were to uh, lay a big wad of cash in my hand, you know, or check, whatever. You know, I, I might even have been—I might even have been dead. I, I mean, I might have actually just killed myself, drinking myself to death. Uh, the last time I rolled into detox, it was point three nine zero. So listen to me—you had all this money. In the end, you end up kind of broke, right? Oh yeah. And that—that's the moral of the story I want people to see because, you know, we do a lot of prison content stuff like that, but also talk about addiction sometimes and how people's lives spiral out of control. And sometimes I ask people, man, and I used to do this in prison, say, you ever ask yourself, what are you worth? And some guys say, man, I'm worth a million dollars. I'm worth 10 million. I'm worth a hundred million. And I would tell people, look, man, when I was, because I was a crack dealer, right? So when I used to stand out on the corner with a gun in my waist and $2,000 worth of $20 bags of crack in my pocket, that's what I was worth, man. I was taking a chance with my life every day for a couple thousand dollars taking a chance of being robbed, taking a chance of going to prison. And, but right. I used to tell them, now I'm priceless, man. Nothing is worth my freedom. Do you feel that way? Absolutely. And uh, this is, um, I, uh, I, um, after I got out in uh, 2015 or somewhere right around there, um, the, the, I mean, I was doing great, uh, you know, I, I mean, for the first six months. I mean, I, I, I had no, uh, um, I had no issues. Uh, and then I, uh, and then I took a drink. And from there, I mean, that, I just didn't stop drinking. Uh, you know, like, it was, it was terrible. I mean, I, I. I'd never drink like that. I mean, I, I could walk into a bar, have a drink and walk away. You know, it was, it wasn't a big deal to me one way or the other. Uh, but, um, I had stopped doing all, all narcotics. I had no narcotics whatsoever for, for 20 years. You know, now it's closer to, uh, like 35 years. Are you off federal parole? Oh yeah. I got off. Settled for all in uh, like 2015, somewhere around there. I only owed him a tiny bit at a time. So listen, I'm going to get ready to close the show. You know, I appreciate you coming on, but is there anything you want to say before we go? Any words of wisdom or shed any light? Yeah. Um, you can tell people it's not worth it, but until they go through their own ordeals it's it's not really going to make a difference but but i can tell you this um i i mean alcohol almost almost killed me i mean um i i mean the um the nurse looked at me she goes i just don't understand how you're able to sit there and talk to me you know i mean that's how far gone i was i mean it's, i'm not bragging about it i mean I, i'm ashamed of it um, and I promised myself if I could ever just get back to the point where I remember what it was like to be sober, I'd be okay. I, I, I'd be able to get out of the hole. And I finally got to that point. I, don't get me wrong. I got a lot of work to do, but 
finally got to the point where I remember what it was like to be sober. Well, Gilbert, I'm going to tell you this, right? You got to keep pushing, man. You got to stay strong. If you ever need someone to talk to, man, you can always reach out to me. I want to see you do good, man. You've been through a lot Thanks of shit in your life. You spent a lot of money in your life. You lost a lot. You lived a lot. And, you know, this is it, man. This is you got to live your best life from this point forward. And I know you're trying to do that, man. And I respect yeah. you for it. I got 600 bucks in the bank right now. And I'm just happy as hell about it. Because it's all mine. That's it. That's what's up. So, listen, I'm going to close the show again, man. I appreciate you. I okay. respect you. You take care. All right. Blood on the Razor nice Wire to TV. You. you too, man. Until tomorrow, with respect, we're out. <laughs>